Welcome to actually the first uh, Q Farm seminar of the year. It's also the first uh, Q Farm US Japan workshop joint uh, seminar. Um, so I'm sorry it's a little packed and we're not anticipating quite as large a turnout. Um, for the locals, I hope you will uh, tune back in next week and the weeks thereafter. We always have good food and at least moderately good speakers. <laughs> um, uh, I think this week's uh, speakers are actually set quite a high bar for the talks. Um, uh, I do want to say for the for our Japanese uh, guests, I hope you're not still stuck here in a week, but if you are, you know, for flight schedule, you're welcome. It's not less crowded at that point. I expect. So, um, the way that we usually run this so that everybody knows is we have a 10 minute speaker from uh, talk from a speaker from Berkeley, and then we have uh, a little break, and then we have uh, a 50 minute seminar from, uh, from, a, from a, a visitor from abroad. Um, if you would like to give one of these 10 minute talks at Berkeley, you can sign up to do that. It's a good opportunity. Um, you get to see some labs, have some lunch with fun people. Um, so, so I recommend that for all the students. Um, uh, our 10 minute uh, speaker today is uh, Leon Liu from uh, uh, Dan Stanford Kearns Group. As a reminder, to keep the pressure down on these talks, we don't do questions at the end, but you're welcome to uh, approach Leon afterwards to talk to him about his group. So, Leon, please bring it along. That works. Hi, I'm Leon. Uh, very honored and uh, happy to be here today. I am a little bit surprised by the size of the <laughs> box. A little bit nerve wracking, but I'll try to do my job. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about using a app array and an awful cavity uh, to realize. Um, various kind of quantum phase transition. Right, so in, uh, specifically, the one theory model I'm going to zoom in on is the so called 50 model. So it's a model that describes uh, when you have n two level systems, for example, spins or other spin like objects, coupled to a common uh, reference oscillator mode, for example, all we have. And Hamiltonian, you'll see, will look something like this. This is like the heavy uh, frequency term. This is the spin long term. And this is the interaction term. And the interesting thing about this Dickey model is that it predicts if your interaction exceeds a uh, critical value, then the ground state of this Hamiltonian will no longer be trivial, as in there's no photon in the cavity spin done in ground state. But rather, it will bifurcate, and you know, technically, mathematically speaking, this component no longer lower half. So it's like a runaway factor. Uh, it will break the Z two symmetry where the cavity either adopts a positive phase or a negative phase, and all the spins will either, you know, point to the left or to the the second C. Right, and uh, you know this. A model that people have studied a lot theoretically, but only until recently there's been experimental realization. And the reason is, if you just look at the model itself, so we're trying to couple uh, atoms with an alpha pattern. This term is usually 100 terahertz, and this is the you know uh, spin energy usually that say it's 20 megahertz. But usually the coupling strength between the cavity and spin is usually also on the magnet level. So bridge the gap uh, of the realizing phase transition, and people just don't have good enough cavities for them on top of it, right? So people uh, in the recent years have came up with equivalent models where you can bridge the gap. So in particular, what people do is they they drive the system from the side. Like so, so that in the rotating frame, 
that's defined by the frequency of the scribe beam, you can effectively lower the cavity frequency by a lot and then realize that model. Uh, so the first work people have realized on this came from uh, Essinger, where the local spin or local two level system is also not really a spin, but a, a mechanical mode of the some mobile, effectively speaking. Uh, and they did observe a very clear bifurcation. And then just nine years later, after that, they produce a, another great work, uh, I think based on uh, the same cavity, that now do they, do they only couple the mechanical group freedom to the, uh, to the cavity. They also use, use, use the fact that the cavity is a tumult cavity and similar fire fringes. And this way they're able to couple the local spin of atom as well. So they do this by effective gradient of spin and then potential. Um, this way there's some spin over the column. It's, it's a richer model. What I want to talk about today is what if you add uh, a twist atomic array for this equation, right? So the previous experiment, they found ball gases, basically. And the, the advantage of having a twist array is first that you can precisely control the size of your <clears throat> system or decide how many spins you have, exactly speaking. And this allows us to study, you know, really look in phase transition. What is a technically phase transition is only defined in thermal dynamic. Like I shouldn't even call it phase transition. But like there are interesting things that to study how does whether you call it phase transition or a crossover happen. <clears throat> right. So that's one. Interesting thing about our uh, apparatus. Uh, the other thing is that we can very well effectively isolate the spatial and spin degree freedom of interesting lines by uh, placing the tweezer size B, even on the node or anti node cap, which is something like, for example, in the previous work I talked about with the uh, spin order coupling. They have both spatial and spin group. Here, if you basically place the atoms uh, on the uh, node of the cavity, you get maximum uh, spatial grouping coupling between the atom and the, the cavity. And if you uh, also pump the atoms onto the stress station emission, you turn off the spin interaction. So this way, effectively, you're coupling n harmonic oscillators. Whereas if you uh, place the freezer potential on the anti node cavity, you do, the, the cavity is not exert force on atoms. And then we can effectively deal uh, the atom as a spin object, um, which is really nice for uh, freedom system. The other thing I wanted, I won't have time to get to is that. Because you have very fine control of the tweezer position, you can study all kinds of effects of okay, this so feedback onto the tweezer position, for example. Right. So I'm going to uh, zoom in on the spin off of the camera of this model. Right. So uh, let me try to convince you on an intuitive level why this is effectively the Dickey model or why it's fine for this. So what we do is you, if you place the atom array on the same side and you know the atom, and you drive it from the side with a verticalized beam, uh, the scatter of each single, you know, local oscillator, effectively speaking, will constructively add up into the cavity vertical polarization, and you know you see some kind of radiance effect that the amplitude is proportional. To the number of atoms, but not the yes. So um, this is shown in one of these works from uh, However, if you position even number of atoms on alternate sign of the <coughs> uh, anti nodes, then the uh, radius scattering or the same polarization scattering gets if, uh, suppressed because things cancel out, right? And now the, the predominant term is the cavity 
uh, emission is actually a Raman scattering term where the cavity, uh, the horizontal polarization mode of the cavity can add up here. And um, so I'll, I'll use these little arrows to uh, symbolize the spin voltage, right? The little magnets. Uh, what will happen uh, about false bifurcation is this. If, for some reason, uh, your local spins adopts a uh, um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, that locally, you know, all the atoms on the green antinode will point a little bit to the right, and all the atoms on the uh, purple antinode will point a little bit to the left, they will, um, through Raman scattering, they will uh, contribute to a horizontal polarization of the cavity mode that has a positive phase that call, that's called green positive. And then this cavity mode added with the side pump beam will create a locally circular, circularized, circular polarized light at the uh, location of each atom. And this circular polarized light will in introduce two kinds of effects. It will awfully pump the atom further. Uh, so that they're 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 further pointed that way, and will also create an effective force that will coherently encourage the atoms to keep tilt that way. So the uh, the, the same um, so that that kind of completes a uh, a positive event, right? And the same would occur if the initial um, spontaneous symmetry breaking is a negative. So that's really how you get the bifurcation. Um, now that's the more intuitive picture. A more rigorous picture comes from the Hamiltonian, where if you uh, add up the uh, the pump field that's symbolized by these uh, uh, sigma plus and sigma minus light, and the cavity field that's uh, labeled here by the pi light, you end up with a Raman complete that couples the uh, the sum of all local spins to the horizontal count, if I was And that's indeed the the key Hamilton. As we as I showed. Uh, this is some preliminary data that we observed in the lab where uh, we see this bifurcation phenomenon. Also it's uh, the, the the critical value is dependent on the, the magnetic field, which kind of controls locally the initial uh, tightness of that combined is if that we see. Um, I'll change topic a little bit here. We've also demonstrated the same phenomena in the, the technical, and I won't get into the details. I'll just show that these two Forking behaviors are almost exactly the same. Um, the other thing that we propose to, and I have to admit, I, I don't have a very clear understanding of this yet, is instead of breaking the C2 symmetry, break the U1 symmetry by having the pump light adopt a polarization that's along the cavity axis so that the system is rotational symmetric around this cavity. And this way, uh, what I think what happened in theory is that the cavity field will adopt a, uh, a polarization that is kind of random and will linearly emit into the cavity. I, I will skip all the theory because I don't have 10 minutes. And this effectively breaks the U1 symmetry instead of the C2 symmetry, um, which is, we can call it a two mode theory. And lastly, just a little bit sugar on top, we also plan on doing an upgrade of uh, adding on ripple interactions. So we'll effectively be able to do um, the icing type model as been demonstrated in the bottom of the group here, very impressive work. And then if you combine those, you are able to achieve something that's called the big icing model, which is something I'm pretty excited about. And with that, I should uh, thank you. Yeah, Dan, who's here, and the rest of the group, and out here with collaborators.
but Wonderful talk. I will introduce uh, our, my, my main event for today. We're very fortunate to have uh, the scene back here visiting us. Uh, give a talk both for the U.S. Japan Seminar and the Farm Seminar. Um, I first met with Sim when I had the good fortune to uh, join his quantum death microscope experiment in Marcus uh, as a postdoc. Um, I say good fortune uh, both because the Sim is an amazing scientist and because I joined it exactly at the right time, right? Uh, after they got these images, and the uh, first quantum gas microscope in the world actually was the one for being built, started working. Uh, and so, what followed was a couple of really productive years, um, really driven by uh, with CM's ingenuity, both on the technical side of things uh, and uh, uh, you know a, a, a deep commitment and understanding of the many biophysics. Uh, and I have to say, uh, after his PhD with Marcus. With team went on uh, to join uh, Martin Fairline at MIT for his postdoc um, and built, uh, uh, I guess, one of the very first fermion microscopes there. Um, and uh, since then, has been uh, at Princeton really uh, blazing a path forward on all kinds of different axes, both in terms of the many body physics uh, of fermionic quantum gases. And in terms of the, uh, the, the the technical capabilities of quantum gas microscopes um, for everything from uh, bosons, fermions, now molecules. Uh, so uh, so I think this talk is really going to be a treat. Uh, my hope is that we're going to get to see some of the real technical wizardry that has made this field go, and also some deep science. So with that, uh, thank you, Lisa. Yes, thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a pleasure always to be here at Stanford and uh, the vibrant community you have here. Uh, so let me start the talk by giving a broad overview of the kind of science we're interested in my group. Uh, in my group. And so we're, 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 what we really are after is basically understanding the rich emergent behavior that you get in correlated systems. And uh, these correlated systems, of course, occur in condensed matter physics all over the place. So here I have a few examples like high temperature superconductors or quantum magnets, or here a lot of people more recently have been studying these quarry materials. And these are examples where uh, the electrons or the spin in the system interact strongly with each other to give rise to novel uh, phases of matter, some of which might be useful for technological applications. And we're very interested in these materials uh, uh, understanding these scales on a microscopic level. And uh, of course, when we try to do simulations of the microscopics of these systems in classical computers, you put them on into an issue, which is the quantum anybody problem. You can't do simulations for beyond a few dozen particles on a classical computer. So the solution to this problem was uh, realized uh, quite a while back in the 80s by Richard Feynman, who suggested that the way around is to use sort of a classical computer, a quantum computer, or what you, call, what you might call a quantum simulator, 
Uh, so this is basically a quantum system, which is very well con controlled, uh, versatile, able to simulate uh, some simple Hamiltonians, which um, are simple to write down, but very difficult to solve on a classical computer. So that's uh, this idea of quantum simulation, which we are which people are pursuing with different types of platforms like ions, photons, and so on. And in my group, we are pursuing this with cold atoms in optical analysis. And so the, the, the system basically is a vapor of atoms that we cool down with laser cooling and rapid cooling down to quantum degeneracy, where you, depending on the species, you get either a Bose Einstein condensate or a general Fermi gas. And you can load the systems into uh, optical lattices, which are basically interfering laser beams that create periodic potentials for the atoms, endowing them with a band structure, just like we have in the real material. So the analogy here is the atoms in these optical lattices and the electrons in a solid. And you can think of these systems essentially as an enlarged model of these kinetic matter systems, where you've blown up the entire system by about four orders of magnitude. So the spacings here are set by the wavelength of light that you're using. So they're on the micron scale as opposed to the angstrom scale. And the atoms, of course, are a lot heavier than the electrons. So that's these factors are what make us if you want to study quantum physics, we have to cool down to much lower temperatures. So the nice thing about these systems compared to, to real materials is, uh, one, we can write down the Hamiltonians, the, the microscopic Hamiltonians describing these systems with exquisite precision, with the precision of atomic physics. We really know what we're talking about. If we are trying to do some controlled approximations, we know exactly what the approximations are, as opposed to the crude Hamiltonians often used in mathematical physics. And furthermore, often with these Hamiltonians, we can often um, control a lot of the microscopic parameters, often in real time. Um, and they tend to be very clean with, with very little impurities, unless you want to use them by hand. So uh, this heaviness of the atoms and the large spacings means the dynamics is very slow, which we think of as a, an advantage in these systems. It's typically on the millisecond time scale. So it's easy to study out of equilibrium dynamics. And finally, this large spacing comes in handy in another way. What uh, John talked about is this ability to image the system uh, with this quantum gas microscopy idea, to image these systems down at the single lattice uh, and single atom level. Okay, so, so we're able to extract information using just optical light or near infrared light at, this, uh, at the smallest possible relevant uh, length scale. So the sort of pictures you get are, are like this. This is a technique that we now has been, so if we went back, if we did this at Harvard back in uh, around 2009 and has now spread to many groups, including in, in Japan and uh, universities. And the, 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 the pictures you see here are basically, these are pictures from uh, our lithium microscope where we're using uh, lithium-6 atoms on this experiment. So lithium-6 is a fermionic isotope of lithium. And so essentially we're producing a degenerate Fermi gas, which is a relatively simple, well understood state of matter, which we then load into an optical lattice. And when we do that, we quench the kinetic energy, enhance the effect of the interactions, and you can adiabatically cross into some very complicated correlated state, which we do not understand very well. Okay. So uh, now you would like to characterize the state by measuring correlations. So what the microscope allows you to do is essentially take a snapshot of the system, an optical photograph, essentially, of the projected many-body wave function, where you collapse the wave function onto a particular realization in spin and density, and you're able with a snapshot to characterize everything about the system by taking the snapshot and extracting the, say, the spin-spin or density for any sort of endpoint correlation function you're interested in. Uh, you can do this over and over by repeatedly preparing, prepare, preparing the same state over and over. And, and you can take an expectation value of the correlation functions. So it's very much the kind of thing people imagine or do in, in when they're doing, say, quantum Monte Carlo simulations of these systems. Here we can do it with an experiment over a much larger system of about, say, a thousand atoms. Okay, so what sort of physics can we study with this? Um, well, when we put particles in a lattice, quantum particles in a lattice, they're usually described by, by what's known as a Hubble model. 
<clears throat> so a Hubbard model is uh, a paradigmatic model for strong correlations in the lattice. And uh, it describes physically kinetic processes and interaction processes. So in, in the simplest form here, we're considering a single band Hubbard model, where uh, in this case, I'm showing it for fermions, just because I'm gonna talk a little bit about fermions in the circle, you could equally write it for bosons. So here with the fermions, what I'm showing is two species of fermions in analogy to the spin states of an electron. So you can take two hyperfine states of your atom and pull them spin up and spin down. Those are pseudospins, analogous to what we have with the electrons. And um, the, the things they can do is they can tunnel between neighboring sites. That's the third term of this Hamiltonian here. Or you can have them hop on the same site and interact. Um, so they, they're in the lowest band, so you can have fermions of the same spin land on the same side because of poly blocking. But if you have opposite fermions landing on the same side, there's a strong on-site interaction. Um, the, the interaction with these atoms tends to be very short range. We model it typically as a delta function potential. And so that, that's why the interaction is only on the same side. And uh, this type of Hamiltonian is deceptively simple. It leads to a lot of rich physics. Uh, there's a lot of parameters you can play around with. You can uh, tune the, the ratio of interaction, the kinetic energy, you can tune the temperature, you can tune the doping of the system, you can tune the lattice geometry on which you're putting the system. And it really describes, basically, it's, it's a very useful Hamiltonian for any sort of strong correlation effect in electrons. And people have been studying it theoretically for a very long time. And we still don't know, for example, even in the simplest case in the square lattice, what the low temperature phases are. So actually, that's that was the starting point for uh, the cold atom experiments was to study this on the square lattice, inspired by the fact that uh, Phil Anderson a long time ago suggested that this type of Hamiltonian might be a basic model for high temperature superconductors. So I want to, in the next couple of slides, just quickly review some of the work that has been done by the cold atom community in square lattices. And uh, I can show you a phase diagram of the Hubbard model because we don't know what it is, but here's a phase diagram of the two rates which we think might be described by these uh, Hubbard models. And uh, you can see there's a lot of interesting phases here, the function of this temperature and doping. So uh, doping here refers to uh, the ratio of particles to sites. So if you call this an undoped, then it's, you have an, an average and equal number of particles and sites. Um, but then you can add some particles, so that's particle doping, you could remove some, that's full doping. And um, we can start by thinking about this over here, where the system is undoped, or what sometimes people call half-filled. And in the coup rates, the coup rates are at strong interactions. So the, the ratio of interaction U over T is quite large, and that suppresses at half-filling density fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to put two particles on the same side because of the large energy penalty. And so at, at this half-filling condition, what the particles want to do is to arrange themselves to have one particle per site, what's known as a mock insulator, up to some quantum fluctuations in the system. Then if you go to lower temperatures, you find another type of ordering that kicks in at lower temperatures, which is called you now the antiferromagnetic spin ordering. And it comes about because of super exchange processes. So we said, the particles don't see each other on different sites, but what they can do is they can hop over to a neighboring site, interact, and then hop back in a second order process. And this second order process known as super exchange is antiferromagnetic. You said antiferromagnetic coupling between the fermions and leads to this antiferromagnetic. So these sorts of phases we understand very well from quantum Monte Carlo simulations of the Hubbard model. We understand that they're there in the group rates. So they're good places to kind of start testing your quantum simulator. But really where things get very difficult for simulations on a classical computer is once you start to build the system. So there you run into something called the fermion sign problem, it's one of the product operations. And uh, that's where hopefully this quantum simulators might shed some, provide us with some useful insights. So some of the interesting phases there, so there's the, the, in the group there's this new wave superconductor down here, but then even in the normal phase, we don't really understand much of what's going on. There's what's called a strange metal, which has some anomalous transport properties on very unusual properties. There's a uh, pseudo gap regime where there's unusual spectral properties. So 
So these are some of the things we could try to probe with these systems. So these are some early experiments, for example, here from the Greiner group, where um, they ramped up the interaction on a square lattice, and uh, the system is half filling in some region of the cap. And you can see that they form this small insulating phase where you have one particle per site in the regime of strong interactions. Uh, you could also now start to look at the spin in the system. You can measure the spin in the system. And what uh, you can do in particular is you can measure the two point spin, spin correlation function, the connected correlation function. And uh, there they, they see a very clear checkerboard ordering. Um, of course, this is a really a quantum Heisenberg antiferromagnet with a lot of quantum fluctuations in it. So if you go and measure the snail order vector that's going all over the place, and depending on how it's oriented relative to your measurement basis, you might see strong correlations or weak correlations. But when you take the expectation value, you get this type of correlation uh, function where with a correlation length that is set by the temperature of the system. So you can compare to quantum Monte Carlo where you can do these calculations down to very low temperatures and extract the temperature of the system. And the state of the art at this point is around 15% of the tunneling. So that's basically a temperature scale where you can still do quantum Monte Carlo and half filling, but once you start to dope, it really starts to break down. You basically with quantum Monte Carlo, you typically get about 30% of the tunneling or so. So in a sense, this is already achieving quantum supremacy in these experiments for a useful task in the condensed matter system. Okay. So, okay, so now moving away from this half filling to the more interesting regime of doping, there here are some highlights of a few experiments. This is an experiment from my group where we tried to measure transport of the system. And in particular, we looked at there is a solidity as a function of the temperature in a doped Hubbard system, where we picked a doping close to where you see this uh, critical point here. So you, if you're at high temperatures, you get this strange metal regime in the, in the group rates. And uh, there we saw uh, a linear resistivity, which is how the strange metal is defined, that it has a unusual linear resistivity in temperature. Uh, usually for a positive particle system governed by interactions, we'd expect a quadratic behavior. And so we discovered this linear resistivity, and since then people have verified this exists via um, various theoretical techniques. So for example, this, and the nice thing here is you can start to distinguish between the theoretical techniques that work well and those that don't. So here's, for example, uh, a dynamical mean field theory calculation, which is a very common used technique in Gernas matter theory. It doesn't work so well. Okay, it's, it's approximate, it actually is only exactly infinite dimensions. So if we're applying it to 2D, clearly it's, it's a poor approximation. Here's a finite temperature lamp loss, works reasonably well. Um, and uh, here I'll also, also highlight work from Stanford, from Tom DeVaro's group, where they've done similar calculations with one of Monte Carlo, and they find also a good agreement with this linear behavior. So that's the kind of measurement which you could do in a condensed matter system, a transport measurement. But here's the measurement. These are measurements that are particular to microscopes. You can, you can do transport where you start, for example, with this antiferromagnet, and you punch out the hole, and you go and watch how this hole propagates in the system. You can track this in single hole as it moves around. And uh, some of the highlights here. Uh, so here's one thing that people have always had this picture of in textbooks, but never were able to see in this in the group rates, is that uh, if you have a hole that you insert into the antiferromagnet, this hole will uh, sort of split into a spin-on and a hole-on, and the hole-on would move around and disturb the antiferromagnet. So in its, uh, in its wake, it leaves this sort of trail of unhappy bonds, which are not antiferromagnetic, so they cost energy. And it moves around, and you kind of basically form this, what's known as a string, with effectively a tension that's linear in distance. And uh, it holds this hole on and the spin on together. Okay? So uh, you can directly visualize these with, from these snapshots. And... Uh, Basically, you can think of this, of this bound object as some sort of effective polaron that moves around with some effective mass. The spin-on is the heavy part because it has to move through super exchange, but the holon can fluctuate quickly because it moves with the tunneling energy scale. And uh, this entire object moves around as a polaron. So 
it disturbs the local antiferromagnetism around it. And you can directly visualize that by measuring the spin correlations around the dopant, then you see indeed they are different from say the bulk antiferromagnet far away. If you, if you go and look near a dopant, you, you see this localized polar on whose length scale is on the order of a cycle two. Okay. Okay, so that's a quick review of what people have done in the past. And now what has really opened up a lot of new possibilities in recent years has been the introduction of more programmable lattice geometry. So usually you would build the microscope around a particular lattice geometry like the square. But now people have been able with some technical achievements I don't want to get into, you can sort of program a lattice geometry over with a lot of very interesting lattices that are accessible just to software. They can change parameters and they can switch between a triangular lattice, a square, Kagome, a lead, and access different types of physics like flat bands or frustration and so on. So that has really opened up a lot of new possibilities with these microscopes. And I want to tell you a little story about physics with a triangular lattice. Um, so the triangular lattice is something that actually Phil Anderson was thinking about even before the story with the two grades. So he was actually considering what happens when you, uh, what is the ground state of a spin one half antiferromagnetic system on the triangular lattice within the Heisenberg model. Okay, so the Heisenberg model is just a spin model. So we're not, we don't have any moving uh, particles here. It's just their localized spins. And what is the ground state? And the, the interesting thing about the triangular lattice is of course, is the phenomenon of frustration. So if you go on a plaquette and you put up spin up and a spin down, well, those are antiferromagnetic, those are happy, but then what do I do with the third spin? And what Phil suggested at the time was maybe what you should do is pair up those spins in a singlet and then cover the entire lattice with these singlet bonds. But there's no reason to do choose a particular configuration, so maybe you just form a superposition of all the possible coverings. It's a pretty complicated state, you call the resonating valence bond state. And that was the start of the field of quantum spin liquids, really, which is now a very hot topic in kinetic physics. You basically have these systems where even at zero temperature, they do not order. Uh, and turns out this was one of you know, the things where Phil actually started, again, something very exciting, but he was actually not right about this. So, so actually in the Heisenberg model, the system does find a way to order. And the order is something like this. What you get is a 120 degree knee up ordered state where the spins are oriented in the plane at 120 degrees relative to each other. Okay, so you can see already this is interesting in the Heisenberg model. And I told you the Heisenberg model is a model which is, describes what you have in a Hubbard system in the limit of large interactions at half filling. Okay. But once you introduce, say, charge fluctuations, this is the, the Heisenberg model is no longer an accurate description. And actually, there, people think that with intermediate interactions, there might be a quantum spin liquid in the triangular lattice for the Hubbard model. There's still a lot of debate about that. So, but my point is already on the level of half filling here, the triangular lattice is much more interesting than the square lattice where we understand things. And now you can start to imagine doping the system and there things would get even richer. So that realization spurred a lot of uh, few groups around the world to start considering uh, triangular analysis, building microscopes that are able to access these triangular analysis. And uh, there was work that, and the workshop I think was from Professor Okahura's group uh, that was reviewed yesterday for bosons. Here are a couple of groups, including mine, which are working on fermions in the triangular lattice. And uh, so I'm going to show you first some results at half filling. And in, in our microscope, we have this capability where we can actually, just before taking the image, we can separate the two spin states with a stern gerlach uh, magnetic field gradient so that you can look at both the up spins and the down spins simultaneously. You take pictures of them simultaneously. Uh, so you can reconstruct from the snapshot on the lattice site, whether you have an upspin, a downspin, a doublon, or a hole. Those are the four possibilities you can have. 
Um, so we can take these snapshots, so we can take a lot of them, take the expectation value, and extract, for example, the two-point instant correlation. So this is here um, some data on the spin-spin correlation function. And again, this is um, a complicated quantum integer magnet with a lot of quantum fluctuations. Here we're working in the limit of strong interactions where the Heisenberg model is a reasonable description. So we expect this spiral ordering that I told you about. And I've overlaid a classical cartoon picture of what the spiral ordering you would expect would look like. So here the color is the data that tells you whether, say, you fix the central spin here, whether the spin is primarily anti-aligned or, or aligned to the central spin. And what you see from the cartoons is that once you already this, this classical order is that, for example, these two spins are primarily anti-aligned, while those are aligned in agreement with what we're measuring uh, experimentally. Okay, so this is consistent with spiral ordering, although it doesn't prove that there is spiral ordering. And we can compare with quantum Monte Carlo calculations, and there's very good quantitative agreements. Okay, the more interesting things, as I said, is once you start the two. And so uh, um, I want to tell you a story that actually was inspired by very recent work in the Moray community. Okay, so the, the Moray community uh, basically studies these electronic systems, which are uh, 2D in nature, and they, they stack them on top of each other, and they twist them around each other. And what they obtain is basically an effective lattice, which is enlarged. And uh, for these particular materials here, which are these transition metals that mm -hmm. are you get effectively a triangular lattice for the Moray lattice. Uh, these are, this is work from Jin uh, Shan, by Mike's group at Cornell and Imamoglu's group at TTH. And what they can do in these experiments is they can gate the system and control the doping. So you can go between, say, particle doped systems or whole doped systems. And what they were able to do in this experiment was to measure the spin susceptibility of this Mori system. And what they found was that it was antiferromagnetic when the system is whole doped, but it's ferromagnetic when it's particle doped. So you can tune essentially the magnetism by, by, by gating, which is something very useful for technological applications. Okay. And uh, so this came as a surprise. and. Uh, uh, this was back in 2023, last year, and uh, we were working with some theorists, Eugene Downer and his student, who had a microscopic picture of what might be going on in these systems. And they wanted to test that with, with our uh, microscopes, since we can really, there they can only measure these things like the all things like spin susceptibility, we can get at the microscopics of what's going on. So the key thing that uh, one needs to understand for this uh, for the story they cooked up is a phenomenon known as kinetic frustration. <clears throat> so this is a type of frustration that's reminiscent of spin frustration, but involves the emotional degree of freedom of the electrons rather than the spin degree of freedom. So I'd like to explain that over the next couple of slides. And for that, imagine you just have a triangular lattice, and let's start simple. Let's just put a single particle on there. Okay? So you put a single particle, the Hamiltonian is just a tunneling Hamiltonian, and you can ask what's the ground state. You, you probably know the answer. You just localize this particle over the lattice with equal superposition over all the lattice sites. And so the, in, a, in a band structure picture, the band structure looks like this, and you want to form basically the zero quasi-momentum state. You want to put the particle at zero quasi-momentum. So let, let me describe this in a slightly more contrived way to help me in the next slide. So what you can say is, let's take this particle and delocalize it over this bond. Well, for the usual sign of the tunneling, you know that you lower the energy by forming the symmetric spatial orbital on this bond. Okay, there we go, symmetric spatial orbital. But then you can delocalize it on the next bond, or the next one. And this all works out because the phases are all the same, and you end up tiling the entire lattice this way, which is the symmetric superposition, which is the zero quasi momentum state. Okay. And the result is that you lower the energy by the number of nearest neighbors times the okay. So this is pretty simple. Let's now consider 
the opposite situation, a complementary situation where instead of looking at a particle, we're going to actually put particles spins on all the other sides except for one side. So we've introduced a hole in the system, and now you have the spin polarized gas in the back. And uh, it's more natural at this point to go to your coming Hamiltonian and be right in terms of hole operators and then create them particle operators. So let's basically create a hole by destroying the first one and replace this in the tunneling Hamiltonian. So what you get is instead of C dagger C, you just get H H dagger. Very simple. But this is not normally ordered anymore. And you have to remember with fermions, you have to keep the order always correct, right? So we, we have to anti-commute these two operators. And when you anti-compute those two full operators, you get a plus sign instead of a minus sign for the tunneling. So the sign of the tunneling is flipped. And so what you have to do is flip the band structure for the hole compared to the particle. And so the hole really wants to sit instead of sitting here, when you flip the band structure, those will be the band right here. And so what you get is that you lower the energy by 3t instead of 6t. So the hole is not as happy as the particle. Now, let, let's revisit this again in the, in the other picture, which is you can say, what do I do for this hole on this bond? Well, we flip the sign of the tunneling, so now you have to form the anti-symmetric orbital. That's the lower energy state. Okay, so here's an anti-symmetric spatial orbital. You can do it on the next bond, but then it doesn't work on the third one, right? Because the phases are the same. So this is now frustration, but in the multiple degree of freedom. It's very reminiscent of the story I told you, the spins, but Spatially now. Okay. So that's kinetic frustration. And you can ask, where is this coming from ultimately? It's coming from destructive interference. So when you move in this triangular lattice in this spin polarized background, you find that the whole different trajectories in the triangular lattice will destructively interfere uh, as you go on a flat path, like going this way versus this way. There's going to be destructive interference for the whole. And that reduces the mobility of the whole. So that makes it less happy. So what you have to do to kind of make it happy is remove this destructive interference. You have to unfrustrate uh, it by introducing some distinguishability in the system. How do you do that? You flip some spin on the board, right? Because then when it moves around, these spins will get shuffled and you can tell which way, that which trajectory the whole took. Did it go this way or did it go that way? So you'll remove the destructive interference. So what you have to do is flip spins, and essentially what you what you have to now have around a hole is you have to find to create anti-aligned spins. Okay, so you form this composite object, which again you might call a polaron, okay, a quasi-particle of the system that naturally forms, where you bind spin flips to holes, and you can convince yourself this is the right thing even on a very simple level on a on a plaquette. So let, let's take for example a plaquette where you introduce a single hole and you crank up the interactions to infinity. So when you crank up the interactions to infinity, there's no more super exchange because that goes to square of infinity. So there's no reason for spin ordering coming for super exchange. So the, the, the infinite interactions are only serving to form a mountain slater background, which you will build with a hole. And now you can think about these two spins. They can be either in a triplet or a singlet. Let's start with a triplet. So, the only thing the hole can do is just move around the plaquette, right? And if it does that, it will swap the two spins, but nothing interesting happens in a triplet. In a triplet, you swap spins, it gets the same sign. On the other hand, in a singlet, when you swap the two spins, see here, you get a minus sign. So that minus sign is exactly what's required to cure the minus sign problem we had earlier. And so you release the frustration. Oh, so this is basically a polaron where a dopant, a whole dopant, binds to an antiferromagnetic environment around it. And you can ask, what is the energy scale of this new type of antiferromagnetism? And the answer is, we, we kind of interact into infinity, so there's no super exchange anymore. But there is just the tunneling, right? So that's the only energy scale in the problem, it's T. So naturally, this thing binds on an energy scale of order T. And this is antiferromagnetism, which is very high temperature. So it's, it's on the T scale rather than the super exchange scale. So this is a mechanism for high temperature magnetism, essentially. And 
yeah, once people so start seeing this in the Mori community, there's a lot of predictions of this type of polar on in, uh, in uh, the literature. And so now let me show you the experiments we've done to actually observe this polar on directly. So um, what you have to do now is to, instead of measuring two point correlation functions, you have to measure three point correlation functions. And so you take these snapshots, you prepare a system in equilibrium and from a triangular lattice, you dope it away from half filling. So at, at half filling, you said at large interaction, you get the spiral antiquar magnet. Let's go. Okay. And uh, what you can do is you can go and find a, a whole dopant and then evaluate the spin correlations around it. And what you find, for example, here's 10% doping, is that indeed, this is data now, the correlations around the whole are anticoromagnetic. Go further out, they switch sign. Um, if you go to a lower doping, so if you go to more idealized picture of a single dopant, this mm -hmm. correlation length grows. We, it actually turns out what you get is a spiral antiferromagnet that is mediated by this hole, even if you can't have the change interactions. So it's not coming from, I mean, here you have two competing, uh, two things that are working together, which are the, the super exchange magnetism, antiferromagnetism, and it's further enhanced by, um, by this kinetic effect, which leads to around what holds this antiferromagnetic environment. Now, you remember I told you in the Moray thing, uh, they switched the sign from anti-fermentism to fermentism by doping. So we can also do that. You can go and particle dope the system. And in that case, indeed, around double on dopants, we find fermentism. So the spins now are aligned in the vicinity of a, a double on dopant. So this is for 15% particle doping. And you can reduce the doping to go to this idealized single dopant limit. And you find this growing paramagnetic bubble around the particle dopants. So slowly turns more and more red as you as you um, reduce the dopant. Okay, so here I want to, since we have our visitor from Japan, I want to connect to again a story from Japan, which is a story from uh, Nagawoka, a famous theorist who predicted in seminal theoretical work, uh, he made this prediction, uh, he actually proved a rigorous mathematical theorem about Hubbard systems, where he said, show that if you add a single difference to the system and work in the limit of infinite interactions, very similar to what we have here with the story, the system turns ferromagnetic. So that's what's called Nagaoka ferromagnetism. Now, this was a rigorous mathematical theorem, but it never saw the light in, in, in a real material because it required these very stringent conditions. You put a single dopant and you work at this super large interaction. And the reason the square lattice is that you're competing, the square magnetism competes with the anti in the square lattice. On the triangular lattice, things are much more forgiving. You have this frustration that kind of weakens the anti a lot. And so here you can go to quite finite doping and finite inter interactions and observe this negative with All right, so. Uh, now I want to switch gears a little bit. And uh, so, so far you've been seeing these Hubbard systems where the interactions are purely on site, right? And um, that's because atoms interact with these van der Waals interactions which are very short range. But now you could imagine you might get richer Hamiltonians if you start to go to Hamiltonians where you have offsite interactions in the lattice. Right? And there's people have been investigating this in many ways. Here in Stanford, I know a lot of people are looking at cavities, uh, people are looking at magnetic atoms, and the way we're looking at it uh, in, in my group is using polar molecules. Um, so we're going to go up step complexity from atoms to molecules. The, the molecules now, first, they, they have these, they're polar, they have these dipolar interactions described by potential like this. Um, that's it's anisotropic, it goes as one over R cubed. So this is quite strong, even when the particles are in different lattice sites. The interaction strength is about a few kilohertz on neighboring sites. Before the super exchange was kind of a second order process, so much weaker. And second, I mean, even in the simple case of a diatomic molecule, you have new degrees of freedom, right? You have uh, vibration, rotation, and so on, which you could imagine storing quantum information in. Particular, 
the rotational degree of freedom and the hyperfine internal states are very good ways to store information with coherence times on the second scale. Okay, so again, we call the, the interaction on the kilohertz scale. The, the coherence is on the second scale, which means that you have ratios on the order of a thousand. So you can study long time, say dynamics in a many body setting, or you can prepare states with very small gaps. Or you could even imagine eventually using them for quantum computing as was proposed by Dave here a long time ago. Okay, so what sort of new condensed matter systems can we realize with molecules? Well, one thing you could do is let the molecules roam around in the lattice, and then you realize Hubbard models start to help with these off-site extended Hubbard models. And these can lead to very interesting phases of matter. For example, uh, they can lead to quantum solids. So again, we're seeing the more community, and you can see here the typical of the long-range interactions. You can also freeze the molecules on sites, and they'll still see each other through the dipolar interactions. So there you can imagine, for example, including spins in the rotational space of the molecules, and they'll talk to each other through the dipole interaction. So that's a nice way to create various quantum spin models. Okay, so what's the challenge with working with molecules? Why are there so, so much less experiments uh, on molecules compared to atoms? The challenge is cooling them, right? So with, with atoms, you have these cycling transitions where you can exert radiation pressure forces with light on the atoms and get them very cold. With, uh, with molecules, um, it's hard for a genetic molecule to find these cycling transitions. There's, Certain classes, uh, uh, which uh, which you can cool, like uh, uh, so pioneered by by Ding and and uh, John Doyle are examples where they they are laser cooling molecules and cool, they can load them directly into optical tweezers. Um, they're still kind of emotionally a little hot. Um, typically, you're capping maybe about 10 molecules or so. But the advantage of this approach is that you have, you can see the individual molecules in the tweezer arrays and uh, you can try to manipulate them on the single site level. The competing approach is to say, throw up your hands and say, well, I don't know how to pull the molecules directly, but maybe I can pull the atoms instead. And this was an approach pioneered at Jella where uh, you first pull two species of atoms all the way down to quantum degeneracy. And then you have this motionally pulled gas of atoms, which you can assemble into molecules. So that's called an assembly approach. And it naturally leads to ultra cold, motionally cold uh, gases of molecules. And this, uh, this, molecule, this approach has now yielded generated Fermi gases of molecules and also those Einstein condensation of molecules. So the advantage here is you have much more molecules than this approach. Here you're typically working with like 10,000 molecules or so. The disadvantage is that it's really hard to observe, to get much information about what's going on. These are the pictures here are these absorption images where you get the density, the temperature, but it's hard to get, kind of get this kind of information that they get with a single molecule manipulation. Okay, so what we decided to do about five or six years ago was to combine both of these approaches. So we wanted the best of both worlds. We wanted to go with this assembly route where we have lots of molecules that are emotionally pulled, but then also have the ability to control the individual and manipulate enriched individual molecules using quantum gas microscopy. So we built this ultra cold molecule microscope where we can prepare gases, gases which are ultra cold through assembly, and we can identify the individual molecules. So the, the molecule we're using in my lab is sodium beryllium. This is a uh, bialkali, which is ozonic. Uh, and in the ground state, it has a relatively large dipole moment of about three device, which gives, as I said, about a couple of kilohertz interactions in a typical lattice spacing. Um, and so th this is the, the Jilla approach where we go in two steps, where we first assemble the atoms into a weakly bound molecular state from the fresh box molecule. And then from there, we can, these molecules are quite large, so they don't have much of a dipole moment. But then if you put them in the ground state with a two photon process, a sterile process, you put them in the row vibrational ground state, then they're a real chemistry molecule with angstrom bond length. And then they have a large dipole, as I said here, of the device. 
Okay. Um, okay, so a bit more details about the technical approach. So, so what we do is we actually start with Bose-Einstein condensate supposed species of rubidium and sodium. We load them into allows. Um, sometimes we're lucky and we have one rubidium and one sodium atom on the same side, about 15% of the time. A lot of, and then a lot of isolated atoms. Now, if you have two atoms on a site, one sodium, one rubidium, you can convert them by sweeping across the Feshbach resonance with 100% efficiency to molecules, to Feshbach molecules. And the nice thing about these molecules is they're produced in a very well-defined state. They're in the well-defined electronic, rho vibrational, hyperfine, and even center of mass motional state. They're in the ground center of mass motional state of their individual caps. So that's a great place to start doing quantum science. You have molecules in a well-defined quantum state. And we can verify there are Feshbach molecules by doing some spectroscopy and getting their binding energy. And that's typically about like 10 megahertz or so binding energy. So they're very weakly bound. But then we can, um, so, so before I move on to the next step, let, let me say how you now detect where the molecules are. Like we said, um, we can't directly do fluorescence anything on the molecules because there's no cyclic transitions for sodium rubidium. But what we can do is do silly thing, which is kind of reverse the entire process, right? And so let's say you've produced these molecules, you don't know where they are, there are atoms around. You can get rid of the atoms with a resonant pulse of light. And now we'd like to know where the molecules are. So what we can do is we can reverse the process, dissociate the molecules into back into atoms, remove the sodium atoms with an impulse of light, and then look at the remaining rubidium atoms and just do regular atomic microscopy of one gas microscopy of rubidium to tell us where the molecules are. So the rubidium is acting as a tag to tell us where the molecules are. And we get pictures like this. We can identify the locations of the individual molecules. So now we said we wanted to get them in the ground state. So we do this two photon process and we can get to 95, 94% efficiency in the absolute low vibrational ground state where they have this large dipole moment. In fact, if you just have them in the ground state, there isn't a dipole moment because the ground state is just a symmetric kind of like S type orbital, right? So you know in eigenstates, you don't have a dipole moment. So what you have to do is you have to mix the, eigens, the rotational eigenstates together. And you can do this in various ways. You can apply, for example, an electric field, and that will orient the molecules, and then you'll have a dipole uh, in the lab frame. Or another way would be to couple the rotational states with microwaves. So here, the splittings are typically in the gigahertz range. So you use microwaves, and they can couple to rotational states, and you can induce these dipoles, which now you have these dipole interactions. So, um, the natural type of Hamiltonian you get in this case is that if you started with, say, some molecules in the ground rotational state, so they're not rotating, and another molecule rotating with one unit of angular momentum, then you can swap this rotational excitation between the molecules using the dipole interactions. So this is kind of the process where the rotational excitation gets swapped. And so what you get is something like an S plus, S minus, operator where the spin one half is those two states of effect. And so this naturally leads to a spin exchange or XY model that you're familiar with from quantum magnetism with a dipolar coefficient, right? Because the interaction is dipolar. And this was done, this was first observed in Junier's group uh, about uh, 10, 11 years ago. Uh, but now we want to, I want to show you how we can study this physics now with microscopes. Okay, so let, let me quickly first show you this, this qubit that we're using. So here are, basically we have this rigid rotor, which is the molecule. It has the usual spectrum of the rigid rotor where here, here's the state which is not rotating. These are, have one unit of rotation and those tend to be split by hyperfine interactions. So you can isolate two of those states and drive them with microwave transitions, and you can get nice radio oscillations. And the nice thing about the system is the excited state here, the excited rotational state essentially lives forever on the experimental time scale. Okay, so there's no decay, T1 is infinite. So you, the only thing we have to worry about is T2. Is there, can I prepare superpositions and how long do they live? So sources of decoherence, 
can list a few here. So you can have maybe electric fields and light fields. The nice thing about our molecules is they're in a singlet state, so they don't couple very strongly to magnetic fields. Um, one thing that's quite important is the trapping lights because it can often lead to differential start shifts because of the difference in the polarizabilities of different rotational states. So if you have, say, variations in your optical potential or fluctuating trapping light, that can cause decoherence. So there the trick would be to use kind of magic states which have very similar matched polarizabilities. So we, we've done the usual Ramsey uh, experiment to, to measure the coherence. And in this particular experiment, we worked at an incredibly low filling of the lattice, 1% deliberately. And what, you, what we observe is the coherence time is something like maybe 50 milliseconds without an echo. But then when you add a spin echo to remove the static inhomogeneity due to the trapping light, this decay occurs sort of on the hundreds of milliseconds time scale. And actually the decay is not due to any of these things I listed here. We can actually do a simulation of this 1% filling. That's the line you see here. And it is in very good agreement with decoherence due to the many body interactions. The intrinsic dynamics of the system is what's causing the decoherence. It's not external uncontrolled decoherence. So this is the many body physics that's causing the decoherence here. So, so far we don't really have a number for what is the actual intrinsic uh, incoherence. Okay, so clearly now we have a system which has a very long coherence time on hundreds of milliseconds, the interactions on the millisecond scale. So we can reasonably close, we can now start to use it to study many body physics. And so the natural Hamiltonian is the spin exchange Hamiltonian with a dipolar coefficient. Um, so the first thing we did here was actually repeat June's experiment, which is basically the Ramsey experiment, but now with much higher density. Okay. And so what you expect is, so the usual Ramsey experiment, you put the spins in the equator, right? And you let them evolve, and then you rotate them again by another part of two. So if the spins were isolated, it's not very, very interesting. It's really the, the interactions due to the Hamiltonian would lead to some interesting dynamics. And you can you quickly realize this, if you have an XY model, its classical ground state is just spins along the equator. But there are quantum fluctuations. This is a quantum spin model, right? So it's, it's not an agrossy. This is a quench experiment. And so it's going to start thermalizing and correlations will spread and then be spreading entanglement and so on. And so it starts to thermalize to a very high temperature. And so if you start with the population magnetized, it will sort of go to equal population in the spin states. Along the way, we see oscillations just like June did. And these oscillations have to do with interactions between the molecules. So the frequency here has to do with the bipolar interactions. So, so what we can do is basically monitor the spreading of the correlations of the system as the system entangles and has the stabilization uh, towards this high temperature. And what we observe is that these correlations actually exhibit a lot of oscillations. So here we actually work with something like 5% filling. So it's a relatively dilute system. And you can think of it as mostly made of little puddles. Like maybe in some places you have pairs of molecules, some places three molecules, some places one molecule. It's actually mostly for this very low filling pairs and isolated molecules. The isolated molecules don't contribute anything interesting to the dynamics, but the, the pairs do this swapping of rotational interactions between them. And that leads to this coherent oscillations. And now we can go with a microscope and ask, what is the correlation function, say, for two sites, one lattice apart, or if the one diagonal apart, or two sites apart? And we indeed see that these oscillation frequencies changes, as you would expect, because there's a one over R cube dependence. So essentially, we can map out this one over R cube dependence of the dipolar interactions. OK, so in fact, uh, the, if you just take the dynamics of this simple dipolar Hamiltonian on two molecules, you start from the state and you let it evolve. What you get is this evolution versus time is something like this. Here, this is time here. And what you can see immediately is that at some time, you're going to produce a Bell state. So you start from a product state, it goes to a Bell state, and then it goes back to a product state. So this is like some sort of entangling, disentangling dynamics. Right? And indeed, 
this experiment was repeated uh, a year or two later by um, uh, Lawrence's group at Princeton and also the Doyle group in a more controlled setting of laser pooled atoms and tweezers where they can really take exactly two pairs and kind of separate them very far away so they can neglect coupling between the pairs. And they, they verified that they indeed produce spell states with this type of homotomy. Now, you might ask, what is the decoherence that we see here? And this decoherence is actually, again, consistent not with external decoherence, not this decay, uh, but with the fact that this is a many body system. So, this, this picture of just isolated pairs and singles, that's not quite true, right? This, there's still a long range interaction. And so, eventually, the system will damp out due to all the coupling between these molecules that leads to uh, thermalization of the system. Okay, so I, I want to conclude maybe by just showing you here that this system is much richer than you might think. So you've, you've seen this spin exchange Hamiltonian, uh, where we've, the interactions look very isotropic, but actually that's only the case if you set your quantization axis orthogonal to the 2G plane, which in our case is set by a D flow. However, if you rotate this magnetic field, then the molecules there is you know, a dependence in the, in the dipole interaction that depends on the orientation of the molecules, right? So you can now introduce some frustration in the system. So like molecules this way versus this way, the are attractive versus repulsive. And so that can lead to a lot of richness. And we can verify, we can tune this spatial anisotropy. So, so here you can see data where you see the spreading of correlations in an isotropic system where the, the field is orthogonal to the plane. But then when we tilt it, we see the quality spreading in an anisotropic manner. So that's tuning the spatial anisotropy. But you still have a spin exchange Hamilton. But you could ask, can I go even further? Can I tune the spin anisotropy? And uh, we have indeed done this by flopping techniques. So what you can do is you can imagine starting up with the spin exchange Hamiltonian for a little while, letting the system evolve under it. But then you can rotate your block sphere. And so what used to be, for example, an XY model, later when you rotate your block sphere with a microwave, you get an XC model, right? And then you can rotate back and you can do this very quickly compared to the microscopic time scale. And you get a time average locate Hamiltonian, which depending on the times that you pick can be, for example, something like just XXC Hamiltonian or more generally can be an arbitrary XYZ Hamiltonian. And we've measured this uh, correlations consistent with what we expect from these, these XXZ Hamiltonians. And I think for those of you in the workshop, uh, um, who's also worked after this, now it's much nicer, um, also from Princeton, from Lawrence's group, where he's been playing around with these XYZ Hamiltonians to do things like spin squeezing, uh, formation of bound states, and these XYZ models, and so on. So, so in conclusion, at this point, we've taken these molecules to the point where we can see the individual molecules with microscopy. We have these long coherence times for doing quantum simulations. We've so far been focusing on quantum simulation of quantum spin systems where the spins are localized. But then to tie back to the first part of the talk, you can now imagine letting these molecules hop around and you can go back to studying Hubbard models, but with long range interactions. So that's something, again, we're very interested in. So you can start thinking about TJ models and other models people use for, uh, for uh, superconductivity and so on. So that, I wanna, Thank the members of the group that did this. I uh, highlight also Arif here, who's uh, working on this angular uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, my question is related to when you were discussing the kinetic frustration with doping. Yeah. Um, you were explaining that it's doping is a double on specifically, and I was kind of wondering why it has to be a double on instead of a single particle. But, uh, it doesn't have to be a double on. I put you the earlier results were with the whole. So, okay. so dope, basically, the system is on when you have on average one particle per site, but you can increase the number of particles so that you have more particles than sites. That's doping with double ons. Or you can remove some particles, so you have less particles in sites, and that's whole domain. 
And what we found was in the whole doping case, it's in his anti fermentism on top of the existing anti fermentism from, from super exchange. And then when you double on dope it, you get this switch over from fermentism to fermentism, which is more analogous to the usual metal story. Thanks. Other questions? Have you thought about if it's possible to create an symmetric exchange interaction from PMI? Yeah. Um, this is a trait. We haven't really thought about that. What is that? Um, um, the EMI interaction the instead of x, x plus y, y, you guys, the x, y minus y, x. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, I mean, there's a, you, you can't do any x, y, z model that you want. There is a sort of a section of the, Phase that you can do, and maybe we can after the talk I can show you papers which tell you what 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 is that section is. It might be that this is included. I I, I don't know off the top of my head. I have sort of a technical question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this conversion in quantum information and quantum antibody physics that's going on, right? And on the quantum information side, we think a lot about the points. Um, the story that we always tell with cold atoms and lattices is that the lattices are sort of perfect. Of course, we've learned that they're spatial. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering, in these like precision many body kinds of experiments, do you also see signatures of deface coming from temporal disorder, like spatio-temporal disorder, these sorts of things? Or is it pretty clean? I mean, but when you say defacing, what, what would we measure? Uh, usually it would be like, we see heating in time. But that's, um, a, that's a uniform kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that that for, for example, the stuff time. with the molecules, that's that's an experiment where, at least in the single particle limit, you see a decoherence due to fluctuations, temporal fluctuations of the optical potentials. Now, the, the usual thing is, you do something like a quench like that, you're eventually the many body physics is what decoheres you, not the, yeah, so. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, okay, so so the question is, I think, can you observe that in a many body setting? No, I guess I'm wondering how how seriously ultimately we should take this statement mm -hmm. that the potential is basically not changing. It, it doesn't have high k vector temporal. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the question is, are these the frequency of these modulations? Is it? Sort of relevant on the energy scales that we're considering, spatial and temporal. Yeah, or, or temporal. Um, yeah, I mean it's you know the typical scales here are like hundreds of hertz, to kilohertz. And if, if there is something, it, it's going to lead to probably heating in this many body setting. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll see. We'll be around for the uh, rest of the week. So if you have more questions. Yeah, what?